Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi, uh, I'm Anju Kagal and today I'm going to be telling you about mycoplasma and chlamydia which cause pneumonia. Uh, the common organisms causing lower respiratory tract infections are Streptococcus pneumoniae, Staph aureus, Klebsiella pneumoniae, H. influenzae and M. catarrhalis. But today we are going to be concentrating on this group of organisms, mycoplasma pneumoniae, Chlamydophila pneumoniae, Chlamydophila cytici and Chlamydia trachomatis. These organisms are known to cause atypical pneumonias and they are called so because they do not respond to the beta lactam antibiotics. Of this group we will be restricting ourselves to the first four, I would not be talking about Legionella in this lecture. Let us look at a case study. Here we have Rani who is a 10 year old girl who was previously in good health. Rani presented with fever, headache and a dry cough. Her best friend Maya had suffered from similar complaints two weeks earlier and over the next three days she found that the fever remained raised, the cough became productive with a clear sputum. On examination, Rani's respiratory rate was raised, her temperature was 38 degrees Celsius, pharynx was inflamed and scattered ronchi were heard on auscultation. The x-ray of her chest showed patchy infiltrates, WPC count and the differential count were normal and her gram stain showed scanty neutrophils and no organisms. Her cold agglutination test came positive indicating that she had a mycoplasma pneumoniae infection. So, these are the questions which this particular lecture is going to answer. How did Rani acquire the infection? What are the distinguishing features of a mycoplasma pneumoniae? What is its pathogenicity? What are the complications? And how do we come to a definitive diagnosis? Mycoplasma pneumoniae were first described in 1898 by Nocard and Roux. Initially, they were named pleuronemonia like organisms PPLO. In 1938, Ryman named the disease primary atypical pneumonia because it would not respond to penicillin. In 1944, Eaton grew the organisms in chick embryo and therefore, this organism was called Eaton's agent. Initially, it was believed to be a virus, but in 1961, it was named mycoplasma myco to indicate that it has fungus like branching filaments and plasma because of the plasticity of the shape. So, where do these mycoplasma exist? They are ubiquitous in nature found in plants, animals and environmental sources. They are known to contaminate cell lines and the most important medical ones or the ones which cause disease in humans are mycoplasma pneumoniae, mycoplasma hominis and mycoplasma genitalium and mycoplasma pneumoniae is going to be what we will focus on today. Let us look at the morphology of mycoplasma pneumoniae. These organisms are pleomorphic because they lack a cell wall, but be free to describe what it looks like. 
it consists of three layered cell membrane within which is the cytoplasm within this cytoplasm is the dna then you have soluble rna and lastly we've got ribosomes now mycoplasma are different from viruses because they possess both dna and rna and they can grow on artificial media so they do not need living cells for their survival they appear as tiny pleomorphic cocci with short rods short spirals and sometimes as hollow rings the diameter ranges from 0.15 micrometer to 0.3 micrometer they can pass through bacterial filters they are fastidious and require cholesterol and sterols for growth which are provided by serum which we add to the medium and they demonstrate what we call a gliding motility mycoplasma are known to cause tracheobronchitis and very rarely does the disease progress to become a pneumonia it usually affects young adults and children it is known to colonize the upper respiratory tract and outbreaks occur in crowded areas like schools colleges college dormitories military barracks it spreads by droplet infection after close contact for a pro prolonged period so as you know rani developed the infection almost 2 weeks after maya had her best friend maya had got the infection so because of prolonged contact with her that is where she must have picked it up and that is how rani acquired the infection from her best friend with whom she was in contact for many many days coming to the pathogenesis the organism has a protein attachment factor p1 now what happens is that uh, mycoplasma have a predilection for the respiratory tract so once they have been inhaled they will try and go into the respiratory tract and this with the help of the p1 attachment factor they attach to the base of the cilia following this they block the action of the respiratory cilia the cilia get destroyed and they secrete hydrogen peroxide this hydrogen peroxide causes damage to the mucosal cells and mucosal cells ultimately die and the organism goes deeper into the tissue uh, the hydrogen peroxide which is produced causes lysis of the red blood cells and an inflammatory reaction is produced because of cytokines the clinical syndrome the incubation period of the disease is 2 to 3 weeks onset is gradual fever chills malaise headache nasal congestion and a dry non productive cough are the common features and this at this stage is tracheobronchitis as the disease progresses to the alveoli the sputum becomes more mucoid and blood tinged cathedrals appear and the x-ray may show infiltrates you will find at this stage that the patient can do his routine work and therefore the disease is referred to as a walking pneumonia so what are the distinguishing features of mycoplasma pneumonia infection the most characteristic thing is that although the patient has pneumonia he can do his routine jobs this pneumonia is also termed an atypical pneumonia because the patient does not respond to beta lactam antibiotics as they do not possess a cell wall the complications of mycoplasma pneumonia is serious pneumonia encephalitis hemolytic anemia and renal dysfunction so these are the complications okay let's move on to the laboratory diagnosis of mycoplasma pneumoniae the specimens which are usually collected are throat swabs 
sputum and bronchio alveolar lavage. These are the specimens if we want to detect the organism. Microscopy I will be covering it is not really very useful in the diagnosis. The organism is gram negative, but better stained by GEMSA stain. But because these organisms are highly pleomorphic varying from small spherical shapes to larger branching filaments, they can often be missed. In the laboratory diagnosis to the respiratory secretions we can now add serum when we are going to be conducting immunological tests. So, the various methods of diagnosing would be by culture, by immunological tests where we can detect antibody in the patient's serum or antigen in the patient's respiratory samples and molecular methods where we will demonstrate the DNA in patient's respiratory secretions. So, let us start with culture. Transport of the respiratory secretions is done in PPLO broth. This is then inoculated in PPLO agar to which yeast and horse serum had been has been added. Horse serum is a source of sterols and cholesterol which facilitates the growth of the organism and penicillin and thallium acetate are selective agents. PPLO agar is now being replaced by SP4 which is a sugar phosphate medium. It is more complex and already contains fetal bovine serum. Now, whichever medium we have inoculated in we incubate this at 37 to 39 degrees Celsius in 5 to 10 percent carbon dioxide for 4 weeks. So, this is a very slow growing organism and you have to look for its growth under the microscope because the colonies which are produced are only 10 to 100 micron in size. So, this gives you the reason why the doctor did not uh, send Rani's sample for culture, but instead did a serological test so that he could get a rapid diagnosis. Within 4 weeks you will see typical fried egg appearance of colonies. They possess a central opaque granular area of growth which extends into the depth of the medium and this is surrounded by a flat translucent peripheral zone. A better way of observing these colonies is to stain with methylene blue a procedure which is called the Dyne's method. Here you can easily visualize the central area and the peripheral translucent area. Identification of colonies of mycoplasma pneumoniae is done by the heme adsorption test, tetrazoleum reduction test and growth inhibition test. In heme adsorption test this organism adsorbs guinea pig RBCs on the colony surface. In the tetrazoleum reduction test colorless tetrazoleum compound changes the color of the medium to a red color and therefore, it indicates it is mycoplasma pneumoniae and in the growth inhibition test presence of anti sera can inhibit the growth of mycoplasma pneumoniae. We move on to the serological tests which are used for the diagnosis of mycoplasma pneumonia. We have the antibody detection test in which the non specific tests include the streptococcus Mg test and the cold agglutination test. Both these tests are heterophyll agglutination tests. That is the antigen which is used is shared between mycoplasma and the streptococcus or the human RBCs. We have the specific test that is the complement fixation test, immunofluorescence test and the ELISA using the P1 antigen. Let us look at the non specific serological tests. The cold agglutination test is a test in which we take serial dilutions of the patient's serum to which we add O group erythrocytes. This is then incubated at 4 degrees Celsius. So, that is the cold part of the cold agglutination test. 
and a titer of 1 in 32 or above is diagnostic of mycoplasma pneumoniae. The problem with this test is that it is not reliable, positive in only about 50 to 60 percent of the cases and cross reacts with Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus and Klebsiella pneumoniae infections. So, what it means is that antibodies against these organisms may also give a false positive cold agglutination test. The streptococcus mg test is similar patient serum to which streptococcus mg is added. Agglutination occurs here at 37 degrees Celsius and titers of uh, 1 in 20 or greater than 1 in 10 20 are diagnostic. Again the sensitivity and specificity of this test is very poor. In the specific tests, we have the complement fixation test and the ELISA using the P1 antigen which are nowadays used. They have an acceptable sensitivity and specificity. For complement fixation tests, we have to collect paired sera and what does paired sera mean? One serum is collected during the acute phase of the illness and the second one is collected 10 to 14 days from the convalescent sera of the same patient. And in this sample, in these two samples, you must demonstrate a fourfold rise in titer. The ELISA using P1 antigen is more specific and has now replaced the tedious complement fixation tests. Antigen detection tests, these are more specific and the two common ones which are used are the direct immunofluorescent test and the capture ELISA assay. In both these tests, the mycoplasma pneumoniae antigens can be detected directly in the clinical specimen. In the capture ELISA assay, monoclonal antibodies against P1 adhesin antigen are used in the plates and these will detect the P1 antigen. Molecular tests like the PCR, real time PCR and DNA probes are nowadays being used, however their use is restricted in reference laboratories. The advantage of the PCR test is that it will detect the presence of the organism even before antibodies have started appearing in the patient's sample. The DNA probes detect M pneumoniae ribosomal RNA and shows a 90 percent sensitivity. So, how do we make a definitive diagnosis? Now, let us look at a clinical and laboratory correlation. So, like I said when the patient presents with fever and malaise and chills you will find that the maximum or the highest temperature is usually reached in week 3 to 4. The patient also develops a dry persistent cough where the maximum intensity is again somewhere around about the three and a half to four and a half weeks, but it persists sometimes even up to eight weeks. So, the patient is culture positive from about one from one and a half weeks to about eight weeks with the maximum being from three to five weeks. PCR is positive right from the beginning of the infection till almost 8 weeks. Antigen detection is also seen during this period. Coming to the antibody tests, the most specific antibody test is the ELISA test against the P1 antigen. Now, this ELISA test the antibodies start increasing from about week 2, they peak at about 5 to 6 weeks and then gradually decline till but persist till 9 months. Coming to the cold agglutination test, here again the antibodies will start rising in the second week, peak somewhere in the third to fourth week, but these drop more rapidly by about the seventh week. The complement fixation test shows a rise in antibody titer from again the second week but the maximum levels are found in week 5 to 7. 
but these antibodies persist in the serum till almost 12 months. Treatment for mycoplasma, the first line of treatment for children is macrolides like erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin and in adults doxycycline, tetracycline and quinolones. Clamide, these are obligate intracellular parasites 0.2 to 1 micron in size. Their cell wall is, is rich in lipopolysaccharide, however it lacks peptidoglycan. It cannot synthesize its own ATP and these organisms are not affected by beta-lactam antibiotics. There are three main species which can cause pneumonia, Chlamydiae pneumoniae, Chlamydiae cytosy and Chlamydiae trachomatis. Chlamydia trachomatis is actually more famous for causing sexually transmitted diseases as well as trachoma and so the infections that is Chlamydia trachomatis pneumonia is seen in infants who are born to mothers who have the infection in their genital tract. Chlamydia exists in two morphological forms. We have the infective elementary body and the reticulate body which multiplies by binary fission. So, what happens is that the elementary body comes in contact with the cells of the respiratory system. It is ingested by endocytosis. Within this vacuole, it gets converted into the reticulate body which multiplies like I told you by binary fission and releases multiple elementary bodies which are infectious and will then infect the surrounding cells. Chlamydia pneumoniae is also known as the Taiwan acute respiratory agent or TWAR from names of the two original isolates TW standing for Taiwan and AR standing for acute respiratory isolate. Transmission of this organism is human to human, there is no known animal reservoir. The diseases caused by it include pharyngitis, bronchitis, atypical pneumonia and now the latest to this is the coronary artery disease. As far as the clinical presentation is concerned, most patients are asymptomatic. The incubation period of this disease is 1 to 3 weeks and the symptoms are very often like a viral infection where you have upper respiratory tract symptoms, rhinitis, laryngitis, pharyngitis or sinusitis with fever. Pneumonia which occurs usually does so after 1 to 4 weeks of these initial symptoms. The patient will have a dry cough, scanty sputum and the cough will persist for weeks to months despite therapy. Along with this feeling of uh, malaise also persists for a long period of time. A pulse temperature dissociation that is fever without an elevated pulse is a common feature of a Chlamydia pneumoniae infection. Somnolence and splenomegaly are additional characteristic features of a Chlamydia pneumoniae infection. The laboratory diagnosis sample which we collect is sputum. We can demonstrate the presence of pear shaped inclusions in the cytoplasm. These on Gimsa stain are basophilic. The organism can be isolated in a high containment laboratory in HEP2 cell line, however they show poor growth. Real time PCR can demonstrate the presence of these organisms in respiratory secretion. Coming to the immunological tests, antigen detection tests consist of di direct immunofluorescent test 
and the enzyme immunoacetase. Antibody detection can be done by the complement fixation test ELISA or what is more specific for chlamydia pneumoniae is the microimmunofluorescence test where a single IgM titer of equal to or more than 1 in 16 is diagnostic of the disease. Otherwise, you can also demonstrate a four fold rise in IgG titers by the MIF test. Chlamydiasitasi, <coughs> this is a zoonotic infection. It is a disease of the birds, especially parrots and the organism is shed in secretions of the eye, nose, mouth, feathers and feces of the infected bird. The organism enters by inhalation of dried feces or any of these dried up secretions. The organism multiplies in the reticuloendothelial system in the liver and spleen causing focal necrosis and then spreads to the lungs. It is a disease which is commonly seen in poultry workers, pet shop workers, vets and bird collectors. And remember the infection is only by inhalation and not by consuming the meat of birds. The disease is also referred to as ornithosis to represent other birds, for example turkeys which can also harbour these organisms. However, the term psittacosis is still commonly used by most people. The clinical presentation of a chlamydia psittacy pneumonia, it has an incubation period of 5 to 14 days. The patient will give you history of exposure to bird feces, maybe parrots, maybe turkeys. The disease is mild to severe with an associated systemic illness. In fact, most of the times you will find that the patient presents with a fever of unknown origin where defervescence is usually slow. The patient would have a non-productive cough if at all and chest pain is common but pleuritic pain is rarely seen. Hoarseness of voice, headache, and sinus percussion tenderness is a common feature of chlamydia psittacy infection which would you know make you really think that this could be because of psittacy. Auscultatory findings may not be representative of the severity of the pneumonia. An x-ray chest would usually show a consolidation in a single lower lobe but it can sometimes occur as patchy reticular infiltrates which radiate from the hilum or a diffuse ground glass appearance and often a miliary pattern. Pleural effusions occur in about 50 percent of patients and are small and asymptomatic. Laboratory diagnosis, you can isolate the organism from respiratory secretions as well as the blood. However, the procedure is hazardous, difficult and should be done in high containment laboratories. Serology is a better way of diagnosing the disease by demonstrating antibodies in the patient's sera, showing a four fold rise by complement fixation test or by detecting an IgM titer of more than 16 by the microimmunofluorescence test. We now move on to chlamydia trachomatis pneumonia. As I mentioned, this is a disease which occurs in infants born to mothers who harbor the organism in their genitalia. The child may present with nasal obstruction, discharge, cough and tachypnea. Most of these patients are afebrile and only moderately ill. You may auscultate RALS with good breath sounds, conjunctivitis and middle ear abnormalities can be observed in about 50 percent of the infants. 
Laboratory diagnosis would include demonstrating the presence of inclusion bodies in the respiratory secretions of the infants and these bodies are well defined as compared to chlamydia pneumoniae or chlamydia cytosy. Eosinophilia is another feature of this disease and you can demonstrate a high titer of IgM antibodies in the serum of these infants. Treatment in the babies will be with azithromycin and clarithromycin and what is important is to treat the mother and her sexual partner. So, to summarize, in today's lecture, we have discussed atypical pneumonia. Atypical because these organisms do not respond to the beta lactam antibiotics as they do not possess a cell wall. We have seen that mycoplasma pneumonia causes what we call a walking pneumonia. Although the patient has pneumonia, he goes about his daily jobs quite comfortably. The laboratory diagnosis of all these is mainly by serology or by molecular techniques. Although culture techniques have been are possible, but these have to be done in reference laboratories where you have uh, good facilities to prevent transmission of the infection. Treatment is done with macrolide antibiotics and in the case of mycoplasma with tetracyclines or fluoroquinolones. So, thank you. I have hope you have enjoyed this lecture.